Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for staying and just being willing to hear a little bit more about our church and what our future is. Um, so I don't know if you guys growing up, but if you had family meetings, but um, there's sometimes, you know, families will kind of gather everyone, the parents will gather the kids into a room, they'll have some family meeting to discuss an important topic, where they're going on vacation, or something's going wrong, or something needs fixed, or whatever like that. But um, my dad, every once in a while, would have these family meetings, and I remember this one time when my dad, who's a very loud person, he comes into the house and um, we're all, all those kids, my siblings are spread out around the house. He's like, all right, kids, everyone to the living room. Um, we're going to have a family meeting. All right, family meeting, right? He comes in. So we all come downstairs, come into the living room, and we're sitting in there. And my dad, he, this is what he pulls out, okay? He's like, we got to have a family meeting, Okay. <laughs> And he pulls out the toilet paper. And we're like, okay, this is going to be weird. And he's like, and I think my dad, what had happened is my dad had kind of got, like, annoyed with how many times the toilet in our house was being stopped up, right? Uh, and so he's like, we're going to have a meeting on how much toilet paper you should use, right? So we're like, oh, my goodness, this is ridiculous. But um, he went through this whole meeting telling us what happened telling us why we can't have the toilet stopped up all the time and clogged. And then he go and tells us how we should use toilet paper. He's like, see this? See this? Too much. Too much. <laughs> this is more like it, right? And he goes on and on and on and on. All right? Um, and I, one thing I did appreciate about that was this idea that, like, my dad didn't say, hey, there's a problem. You guys need to fix it. Let's go. Do, do better. Grow up. Let's do it. But he actually did take the time in his hilarious kind of way, because we were laughing through this meeting, um, his hilarious kind of way to tell us, like, what, why, like the why, why do we need to not stop up the toilets? And then he went on to not only tell us why it was important, but how, how to accomplish this goal, right? Um, and that's kind of like what we're going to be doing today, right? No, the toilets are fine, okay? So uh, we don't have to worry about that. But um, a church is definitely a family. All right. If you thought of one of the best descriptions of what a church is, it would be like a family. And so this is kind of like our family meeting, gathering together to talk about some things um, for our future as a church. Our church is also like especially a brand new church, a church plant is often there's stages in the life of a church. Right. And when a brand new church is just um, planted, just started, it's kind of like a newborn baby in a lot of ways. Right. When you have a new baby come into your house you gotta, it takes a lot of extra care. The baby doesn't really do things for itself or on its own a lot. But then as the child grows to the child stage, to the young adult stage, to the full-on adult stage, then there's more responsibilities that the child takes on, more things they could do for themselves, and, and kind of this growth that happens. And even though it, and for a church it happens a lot quicker than the 18 to 20 years or so that it does for a kid, um, it is the same way for a church, that we kind of grow up as a church, that we begin to mature and do some things that need to, um, need to happen in order for us to continue to grow and for us to continue to mature and to continue to grow into the church that God wants us to be. But I think for a lot of us, you know, um, in this room, we have different backgrounds. Some of us have different church backgrounds, different church experiences. Some of us in this room, we are, this is the first time that you've ever even been a part of a church family, right? And sometimes what we can do is because of our different backgrounds or traditions or, or even just being brand new to the church, we don't really understand the why right? The why. Why do we do church the way that we do it? What's the purpose of it? And, and so we're going to go into that today is, is talk of, from the scriptures why we do certain things. But we're also going to talk about the how, how we can accomplish these things and how we can continue to grow up as a church. And so there's four um, main areas that I've highlighted um, that are, are, are biblical areas that um, I feel like our church in this next year can grow in. Right. And things that we can grow in and um, kind of get closer to the Lord and start to mature and develop as a local church. 
All right, and so at the end, also, um, I'll offer if there's any questions that you have, um, then we can we can also discuss those at the end as well. So if you thought of any questions, feel free to ask after um, at the end. So hold those till then, but we want to make sure we do that. All right, so four areas, and um, the first two are a little bit longer, and then the last two are a little bit quicker. All right, so the first one. First, growing in discipleship. My first goal for this next year is to grow in discipleship. So what is discipleship to begin with, right? Discipleship, um, if you notice, Jesus had his 12 disciples, right? Discipleship is exactly what Jesus did with his disciples. That's what he expects us to do with others and with the church to be doing as well, right? That we take people and, and people that be start their journey with Christ first, they begin to follow Jesus, and then they start to grow in Jesus So then when they're able to actually teach others how to grow in Jesus. This is exactly what happened with the disciples, right? Jesus called them to himself. They started to follow Jesus first. Then they developed and grew over the three years that Jesus spent with them. And then he released them to go and teach others the same thing. We get this from Matthew 28, 19, and 20. This is the last words that Jesus spoke while he was here on planet Earth. But to his disciples and to us as a local church, this is our mission. Jesus says, go, therefore, and teach or go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or to do everything I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. And so what Jesus is commanding there is that we, our job, our mission as why we're here on earth, why we're a church, is to make disciples. That means that we are to help others start to follow Jesus, to see people saved, and, and then help also people to start growing in Jesus. That's that whole teaching them to observe, to do everything that Jesus has commanded. So our vision here at Branches is that everyone is everyone in the church is somewhere along that process, right? That either you are being discipled by somebody or you are actively making disciples as well. And sometimes those kind of go both at the same time. All right, so one of the ways that we've started already doing this, and we're going to continue on in the new year, is having a discipleship group. So we have a discipleship group in a kind of a curriculum, and, and it's more of an intensive, it's more intense than just like our normal group's Bible studies, but it's more intense, and it's a little bit deeper, and we kind of a little higher level of accountability as well. But this is the girl where we go through this, and this is going to go from now until um, middle of January where we go through and help people develop and grow to where they are able to teach others also, right? And so our, if those the people that are part of our first discipleship group, if they kind of make it through and, and they do um, what they need to do, then they'll have this kind of graduation in, in February, and we'll start another discipleship group. And so our goal is that other that everyone will at some point in time in their lifespan of being here at branches will have gone through one of these discipleship groups and become discipled right we also have other kind of lesser levels of that which is our our weekly groups in other ways we have two other groups that meet on thursday night and this is a great way if you're not part of a group it is an awesome way that you just get plugged in with family, that you get plugged in with other people. The groups are intentionally smaller so that you get to know people better, get to have um, questions, share, and encourage each other in different ways. But also you get into God's word. And what they're doing right now is they go over the sermon on Sunday. And so they're able to kind of dig a little bit deeper as they go into that. And it's a great way to kind of kickstart your discipleship. So. That, that is um, having people that are actively being discipled in groups is something that is our plan to continue on to do and something we've started. The second part of that, um, as far as our discipleship goes, is having an official membership. Now, when we talk about being members of a church, sometimes people like balk at that idea and sometimes have, people have a problem with that whole idea of like, man, being a member of a church, why do I got to be a member? And I think it's because maybe we're thinking of it in the wrong way. Like this membership of a church is not like I got my Costco card, let me in, you know, kind of thing, right? That's not what that's not what it means. Um, actually, it comes straight from the Bible. In First um, Corinthians chapter twelve, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he's telling them how they should behave as a church. One of the things that he tells them is that everyone in the church has been given a different spiritual gift from God. 
And he's instructing them how they can use their spiritual giftings as part of that church. And he, the analogy that he uses as a church is actually a body, right? So our bodies, our human bodies, we have different parts to our body, right? We got hands, fingers, eyes, ears, brain, organs, all this stuff. Every single part of the body has a different function, but when you put them all together, you have a healthy body that's working properly. And this is the idea of the church. So he says this, and, and this is kind of like the, the, the central verse of that passage. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, But now hath God set the members, and that's where we get that word, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. The idea there is that God is the one that brings people together in the church. And um, we see that in Acts as well, that the church, God, it says that God added to the church daily such as should be saved. And he brings us together to be part of that body, right? To be an active part of the body of the church, to be a member, right? And it's not necessarily, again, it's not like having a membership card. It's being a member, being a part of that body and, and using the giftings that God has done to um, for his glory in us. And it's it's helpful because to have a, like you might want to say, okay, why do we got to have that official? And, and so here's kind of like some real practical ideas why to kind of have like people on like a list that says, hey, these people have committed to being an official member. Here's why this is important, okay? Imagine this. Imagine, um, again, going back to like the family analogy. Imagine that you're in the house with a bunch of kids, right? Some of those kids are there because they're your kids. Other kids, you're just babysitting, right? Now, how would you treat those children? If you're the one in charge, obviously you're going to care for all of them, right? It's not like you're only going to feed your kids. You're like, no, kids, stay back, right? You're going to feed everybody, right? You're going to take care of everybody. You're going to make sure everyone's okay. Make sure everyone's safe. You're going to make sure they're all good. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, those other kids are going home, and the kids that are yours, you have long-term goals for, right? The kids that you're babysitting, you have short-term goals for, right? Because you're not making college plans for the kids you're babysitting. But for your own kids, you're going to have longer-term goals. And the same kind of practicality works within the church as well. The Bible calls a pastor, the word pastor actually means shepherd. That's where we get the idea that a shepherd, that God has given the shepherd to a church to watch over the flock of the church. It would be very hard for a pastor to do their job properly or for a shepherd to do their job properly if they don't know which sheep is, is part of their fold, right? If there's like, are those random? Are those part of ours? You know, stuff like that. And, and so here's this works out. It's not that we don't care. Anybody can, obviously, anyone could come and join in with branches, can worship with us. You can serve even with us without having an official membership kind of title thing. You can do a lot of different things. But the, just for practical reasons, it helps us to know who has been committed. That way we can make long-term goals based upon those and, and show different benefits as well as different responsibilities. It's also like this. Imagine this scenario, okay? Imagine I died, right? No one say amen. All right, imagine I died. Okay, if I died today, right? And you as a church, you say, you know what? We want to keep going. We got to find a pastor. So you call someone either within our congregation or someone outside the church um, that you come and that you want to be the pastor. How would you as a church collectively vote on whether that pastor should be the next pastor, right? And here's the idea. Who would get a vote if there's no official membership, right? So that means that if any random person just came in here for one Sunday – that just because on that Sunday they were voting that everyone gets a vote, right? Um, to, and so that one person that just came one time gets a say in the future of the church, right? Or if we're going to do something else, like um, again in the future, maybe God leads us to make a big expenditure on something like a building or something like this, right? And we want to make sure everyone's on board within the church, so we want to take a vote for that. Again, if someone is not committed and they just showed up, if we don't have that official membership in order to do that, then that would mean that everyone kind of just gets a vote. Or it means the opposite, that there's one person that just decides everything, right, which is also not necessarily healthy. And so having that official membership is, is, is scary, I think, for a lot of people because it does mean commitment. And we live in a society today that is, is very anti-commitment. We see that across the board in a lot of different ways. But um, it is a biblical thing 
to be committed to a body, to be committed to a church. And so, again, it's not that if you decide not to become an official member that you're going to be uncared for or that you're not welcome or that you're outsider in some way. It's, of course, not, not it at all. Um, everyone is allowed to attend and join in and do things. But there are certain instances where that official membership, people that we know are committed, allows us to make longer-term plans. It allows us to better care for people for the long period, for long periods of time, and over over the course of many years, and instead of just you know seeing people every once in a while. And it also works out practically in other ways as well. So what we're going to be doing in this next year is this. We're going to be working on our official membership. And how we're going to do that is we're going to – have a few short classes, um, most likely like right after the service time on Sundays, and um, where we just explain what that means to be an official member and make sure everyone's saved and baptized scripturally, things like this, and then um, then you'll be an official member. So it's, it's not like you got to jump through a lot of hoops or anything like that. It's not hard. It's really just saying, I'm, I know what this, I understand what it means, and I'm, I'm willing to be committed to the church. Okay, so that is another way that we're going to grow in our discipleship. I'll pause right here after each section and say, does anyone have any questions? Good. I love when I explain things so perfectly that uh, that no questions. I'll say that after every point because you guys are all scaredy cats. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. I'm just kidding. But for real, if you, if you want to talk to me about any of this stuff, feel free. I'm open to absolutely everything. All right, next, okay, next. Uh, so that's the first part. We want to grow in our discipleship. The next part is growing in giving, growing in giving. Now, here's the thing about church and money, all right? There's a saying, it's not awkward unless you make it awkward, right? Um, but here's here's the thing, I think, and I, I, when I've encountered people and talking about this, especially when it comes to talking about money in the church and things like this, we got to realize one thing, that money is simply just a tool. That is all that it is, right? It's just a tool. It's nothing dirty or shameful. I mean, it might be dirty if people sneeze on it. But besides that, it's not. It's really just how you use it, right? It's a tool meant for the Lord. And so imagine this. Imagine like you were building a house, right? I got more props. Don't worry. Imagine you're building a house, right? And you're constructing this house with a whole bunch of like this construction crew and things like this. And someone's like, oh, do you have a level there that I could use? And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't talk about levels while we're building a house, right? That wouldn't really make sense, right? A, le a level is simply just a tool that uh, helps you to build the house, to make sure things are level, that makes sure things can keep going properly in the right direction, right? It's just a tool. And it's the same thing with money, right? Money is just a tool that the church is able to use to be able to spread the gospel and to reach more people. Right. Um, the Lord Jesus, we see in the scriptures, one of the main topics that he talks about, if not the thing that he talks about the most, is actually on money. And I think that is probably because Jesus knew our own hearts and knew how easy it is for us as humans to make money an idol in our lives. But Jesus is not. And one of the things, again, that's cultural with us is like this idea. And this is a total. It's, we got to recognize that this is just a cultural thing. Right. Like the idea that, you know, when we when you hear this all the time, like in common polite society, you're not supposed to talk about your salary or ask anybody like what they make and stuff. And I'm not saying that you got to go around doing that. Right. But I'm saying that that is just a cultural thing. And the reason that is, is because in our society, in the world's society, people place value on people based upon how much money they make. Right. And that is totally not biblical. Right. Your value is not equal to how much dollars you got in the bank, right? It's That is just, it's baloney. But that's the reason why, because either people get too prideful about what they make or they feel ashamed about what they make, but realize that wherever God has put us, right, that's where God wants us. And, and that there's not, it's nothing to be ashamed about. It's just a tool that God gives to every single one of us to use for his glory, just like God gives everything to us, whether whether our, our bodies or whatever we own or, or in our time and our talents, all is meant for to be for the glory of God. And so it's just it's just a tool. But maybe to make it easier on everyone's ears, maybe I'll just refer to money from now on as levels. Okay, that way it's it a little bit easier. So how how do we um, give to the church and how do we give back to God? 
We do this through our, our tithes and our offerings, okay? Our tithes and our offerings. Now, tithes and offerings, um, giving back to God, all our levels. Um, we give that to God. Um, and we see this, uh, the tithe is 10% of what um, our earnings are. We see this as an example. It was started with Abraham. It carried on through the Old Testament, even up into the very last book of the Old Testament where God even says, you've robbed me. And the people say, where have we robbed you? And he says, in your tithes and your offerings because you haven't given those to me. And then we see what's really important is we also see this carried over into the New Testament. Um, Jesus actually confirms tithing in, in Luke eleven thirty two. So we'll look at this. Jesus is discussing with the Pharisees. Pharisees were the people that were hyper-religious. They were concerned about keeping every single detail of the law. But they also had a lot of lack of love. And so this is what Jesus says to them. He says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These you ought to have done and not to leave the other undone. This is what Jesus is saying to them. See, the Pharisees, they were hyper concerned about keeping the law perfectly. So they would even go into their spice cabinets, dump out the little herbs and say, okay, 10% here, 10% here, right? They were super crazy about that, right? But here's the thing. They didn't have the love of God in their hearts, right? They didn't show other people love. They were super prideful. They didn't show Jesus any love. They didn't have righteous judgment in their hearts. And so Jesus admonishes them to hear, and he says, here's the thing. You ought to have done these things. You should have shown love. You should have shown righteous judgment. But then he says, but you shouldn't leave the other undone as well. The idea being, yeah, tithe, that's good. Don't leave that undone, but also show love and justice and, and righteous judgment. So it's something that we see in, in the scriptures that every follower of Jesus is commanded to do. Um, it's, it's something that we, again, to work out to honor God in every single area of our lives, we honor him with our levels. Okay, All right, we give, give back to the Lord. Now, one question that I've gotten um, several times, either from people outside the church or even people within the church, is this question. And it's actually a really good question. Why does the church need money? Or, sorry, levels. Why does the church need levels, right? I grew up in a pastor's family, and so I kind of got to see, like, the backside of what it takes to, you know, church and stuff like that. And so it always made sense to me, but I totally understand that because a lot of times when we think of levels, we think in terms of like profits and things like that. So why does the church need that? And again, let's go back to the family analogy, right? Think about your family. Think of all the reasons why your family needs levels, okay? Money. Laureen, we're talking about money, but it's levels, okay? Uh, just catch you up. It is going to be very confusing for you from around. Um, but we're, why does your family need that? Think of all the different reasons why. Those are all the reasons why a church family needs the, needs levels, needs money to be able to operate. Okay, And for instance, think about this room that we're sitting in right now. This is rented, right? We do not own this. So that means we rent it for three hours every Sunday. Um, we rent two rooms, one in here and one for the kids' room. And it costs us about $1,500 a month and sometimes extra if we, if we um, rent it out for extra hours, right? That's got to come from somewhere right? Um, sometimes I think people, uh, I know I've talked to people like this, it's usually people outside the church that assume like everything's just free for churches or something. Like I get to go to Costco, fill up my cart, walk out the door, like, excuse me. It's like, no, it's, I'm a pastor. It's okay. And just walk on, right? <laughs> um, but that's not how things work. You know, you gotta, you gotta pay for stuff. Um, you gotta pay for stuff, right? Um, food, right? Food that our church provides at different times. A couple weeks ago, right? We had um, catered Chipotle, which is awesome, um, and snacks. We got coffee every Sunday, stuff like that. It builds up supplies, right, within your own family. You got to pay for all the different kinds of supplies that you need in your house. Same thing with us. We got sound equipment. We got signage. We got other supplies that we need. Bills. Sometimes people don't really think about this, but just like your own family has bills, a church actually has bills, right? Um, for instance, one thing that's required for us um, to even meet in this building and to be a church in general um, is not to be a church necessarily, but it's something that is definitely need to, um, if you're going to be wise, is like insurance, right? We pay liability insurance every single month so that we can meet in this space. And just in case any crazy thing happens, we do. And that's something that we probably in the next year need to even up, bump up a level as well. 
Um, but that's 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 money every month paying for insurance and, and other bills like that. Reaching others, right? The gospel is free to all, but sometimes it takes levels in order to get the gospel out, right? Some of you in here, you've come to branches because you saw a Facebook ad, right? That took some levels to get that Facebook ad out. Some of you came because you got a door hanger on your door, right? That took some levels to get get out there as well, or a postcard, or you um, were part of our outreaches, or the Easter egg things, or whatever else we've done, that takes levels in order to reach people, right? And then finally, um, the last one, and this one's going to seem really self-serving, but again, imagine I'm dead. All right, uh, the last one is is salaries, okay? And a lot of times I get this question as well, well, why do pastors um, need to be paid. So first off, I don't get paid anything from the church at all right now. Um, I haven't taken a single dime or anything like that. So let's just imagine I'm dead again. Okay. Imagine I'm dead. If I was, if or I was, if I passed away, imagine if I passed away, okay, that I'm, I'm in heaven, right? What would I want for you guys to know as a church to be able to function properly as a church? Well, in first Corinthians chapter nine, Paul again is writing to um, writing to the church in Corinth, right? And he's telling them um, he's telling them how they should function as a church. And one of the things that he tells them is that they should provide um, part, at least partially, for for their pastors. And he uses two Old Testament Old Testament um, examples. The first one he uses is an ox being muzzled. In the Old Testament, there's this law where you weren't allowed to muzzle your ox as you were like treading out the corn, right? As you were plowing through your corn and gathering all of it, that he would use the ox would be your main engine to like bring your plows and all this stuff. You weren't allowed to put a muzzle on them, right? The ox then could like eat some of the corn as it's being treaded out. It was a law that you could not do that, a law that God gave. Because it was considered kind of like, I don't know, animal cruelty, but it also went along with, you know, if someone's gonna do a job. They, they deserve to reap some of the benefits of that job. And so he tells them, he uses that example, right? That if the ox is working for you, then he should be able to have some of the corn. And the other Old Testament example, and this one's always crazy for me to think about as well, is, is the priest. He uses in 1 Corinthians 9. Old Testament priests, if you think about it, they were at the temple 24-7, right? Pretty much, right? They had their shifts at the temple that they worked and, 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 and were there all the time. How did they get the levels that they needed to live life in general. Well, what's interesting is God ordained it, God commanded it, that when people were coming to the temple to worship, right, and they would bring their lambs or their, or their bulls and things to sacrifice these animals, the priest would take them and, and sacrifice them. But here's the thing. They wouldn't burn it up completely. Some of the meat from those sacrifices that the people brought Actually, God commanded that it was given to the priest so that they could have something to eat or if they needed extra levels, they could go and sell it in the marketplace to live off of it, right? Even the table of showbread, there was bread that was cooked regularly and put in the temple as kind of just like this holy bread that, that was concentrated to the Lord, but they wouldn't let it rot and just go bad. It was taken out of the temple and the priest of the temple would actually eat this bread. And so as a way... It was actually our sacrifices or the people's sacrifices to God that God then used to provide for those that were serving. And so he uses this, Paul uses this as he's writing to the church in, in Corinth, that this is the same way as ministers of the gospel work today. That we bring our tithes and offerings and God ordains that a portion, portion of that goes to be able to help supply for the pastor's needs as well. And again, I know this seems ex extremely self-serving. But this is just what the Bible teaches. And I'm totally fine with, again, forgoing all that um, even even longer because I know that we're reaching people um, with that. But if I were to not be here, that's something that I would want you guys to understand as a church. And so our church right now, um, and, and this is also the way God has set things up in, in the scriptures. We see that Paul, when he would go to start churches and other places, there were other churches that supported him. And supported these new works. Same thing goes with branches. Right now as a baby you can't support yourself. Right? But as you grow you do grow to be able to support yourself. So right now our church is actually supported um, by outside. There's other churches. Other individuals across America 
that actually have given financially and other people in these churches that give financially so that our church can exist and survive and thrive. And so that's something as that won't last forever, and that's something that as we grow up as a church family, that we want to start providing for ourselves, right? And so there's there's two ways that you can, um, or there's there's a way that you can start giving, and and that is just through our either on our offering box at the back or online. Our online giving portal is awesome. You can hook up your ACH to that, which is it costs. Um, there's no fees associated with it. You can even set up um, recurring gifts to be able to make sure that you're giving back to the Lord. But the Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. Um, Jesus even says that it's better to give than to receive. And again, our society is built upon this idea of like how much you own equals your value. But actually, according to Jesus, it's more about how much you give, right? It's about how much you're willing to give back to him. When Jesus saw, he was, there's this another scenario, which is again, crazy to think about with Jesus, but he's in the synagogue, right? And there's a place kind of like we have like a box. They had like a money box, right? And Jesus is literally sitting there watching what people get, which is kind of nuts, right? Can you imagine like leaving out the door and Jesus is like just looking at you like, what you going to do, right? Like it's kind of weird to think about, but he's literally watching people. And people are giving and giving and they go sit down. And then comes this widow, right? And this widow is absolutely poor. The only thing she has left to her name is basically two mites or two little pennies. That's it. And she gives those back to God. And as she's walking away, Jesus stops everything and says, hey, everyone stop. This woman has given more than everyone else. And it's not because of the amount that she gave, right? Because he says everyone, then Jesus says that everyone else gave of their excess. They gave of stuff that they wouldn't even miss. It wasn't really even a sacrifice to give. But she, she gave of everything she had, right? And Jesus honors her for that. And so God honors our giving and it seems, and I'll, I'll tell you this too as well, man, it seems so anti-logical. It is so anti-logical to give to God because then you know what that seems? That seems like we will have less. But that is not how God's economy works. When you give to God, God gives back to you. I, I could sit here for literal hours and I could tell you stories of my parents who were, and Haley's parents, by the way, who were dirt poor, right? My parents were multiple, multiple jobs. Still, we barely made it through. And they gave faithfully to the Lord and how God took care of them over and over and over again. And I can tell you stories about Haley and I over the past 10 years of being married and how we, during times in our lives, we were without, I was without a job and she was without a job. And yet we stayed faithful to giving to the Lord. And God, man, I'm so passionate about this because I know I know the blessings of God that he's shown to me through being faithful to giving back to him, tithes and offerings and grace giving abundantly to him and how he over and abundantly just gives back and how he takes care of you. And you just get to sit back and you're just like, man, that was a miracle. That was a miracle. That was a miracle. That was a miracle. And man, I just, I want that for you guys. I want you to be able to experience those miracles of God's provision in your life over and over again, as I've experienced. And it seems anti-logical, but man, when you start giving to the Lord, and, and it's really anything, you start giving yourself over to God, He brings blessings into your life in a lot of different ways, right? And so for our church to, um, to grow up, um, to continue to now not take the support from others, but to start being self-sufficient, then we need to also grow in our giving, in our and our tithes and our grace gift offerings back to the Lord, all right? All right, next, okay? Oh, pause. Any questions? Yes? I'm just curious, how much a month does it take for branches to exist all together? Good question. I have somewhere, not here with me. Um, I have, let me look here. Actually, it might be on this. There it is. So I put together... Um, and anyone that wants this, I can send it to you as well. Put together a loose budget, okay? Because we've only been going for a year, there's not been an actual budget, right? Because we have nothing to look back on to see how much we can count on. But this is that's going to change in this next year. There's a loose budget right now, and this is very bare bones. Again, um, it takes about four thousand dollars a month to to for the church to um, 
to do what we're doing right now, right? Um, and again, that doesn't uh, account for any growth or like this is a big one. This center is actually going to be torn down probably at the beginning of 2024. So we'll only have it for another year. Um, and our rent here is amazingly cheap for San Francisco. So that, what that means is that we're going to have to find another place. And so our rent will never leave go up. Um, but that's, that's kind of give your answer. I have a breakdown. If you want that, I can email it to anybody. Send me an email. I'll email it to you. Um, I like that. So, but that, again, that, that includes, uh, there's several things that would be, that we would hope to grow in, but that's not included. But that's what it takes right now. All right, good question. Any other questions? All right, moving on. All right, enough with the levels. All right, next. Okay, number three, grow in leadership. Grow in leadership. Okay, so if you want to know my philosophy for how to start churches, if you read Acts chapter 14, that's it, okay? I just try to do exactly what Paul did in Acts chapter 14 and just do that, okay? Um, in Acts 14, this is exactly what Paul did. It's, a, it's an amazing passage, and if you really dig into it to see, you get to see how the early church worked. You get to see how churches were started. It's just an awesome thing. So Acts chapter 14, go home, read it. It's amazing. This is what Paul does, though, right? Paul's traveling. This is his second missionary journey. He's traveling from city to city to city. So he's traveling all around. In each city, he gets up. He preaches the gospel. People come to know Jesus. And then he moves on, right? So people got saved in the city, but he moves to the next city. People get saved. Moves to the next city. People get saved. He gets to a city called Derby, right? There he stays for a while, and then he does a U-turn at Derby. And what he does is he starts to go back to all those cities he had already visited. He goes back to all those people that had come to know Christ, and it says two things that he did. First, it says that he made them into disciples, right? He encouraged them in their faith. He helped them to grow deeper in their faith, made them to, into start the discipleship process with them. But the second thing he did is that he ordained elders in every church. Do I have this? Yes. Okay. It says, and when they had ordained the elders, elders, by the way, is another word for pastors. There's three words in the Bible that are used for the word pastor. They're all synonymous. They have just different connotations to them. One is elder, one is bishop, the other is pastor. It says, when they ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord whom they believed. So the last thing Paul did in the church, as, as he had seen people saved, as he made disciples, as he before he left and moved on, he ordained this leadership within the church. And it was pastors, it was these elders that were, were ordained to like lead the church. Okay, that's the job that, that God has done. And so in the scriptures, in the New Testament, we actually see that there's two kind of, I guess, positions, I guess if you want to call it that, within the church that are given. Okay. One is pastors, and the other one is deacons, okay? So, in, and some people don't know this, but there's actually qualifications and job descriptions for both of these, um, the, both these positions. So, we see first pastors' qualifications come in 1 Timothy chapter 3, as well as in Titus. There's a list there, and it's literally a list of qualifications that you have to be in order to be a pastor. And it all has centered around this idea that basically you have to be a good example, right? It's nothing crazy, right? It's nothing like you have to know everything and da-da-da-da. It's nothing like that. It's just simply you have to be someone that sets the example of following Christ to everyone else. And so you need to have some of these key character qualifications that are, are centered around Jesus. There's also a job description for pastors. The job description, it comes in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 when it says that God gave some pastors and teachers to the church, and it says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So the role of a pastor, the job description, is actually that he can take the people within the church and equip them, help them to do the work of the ministry that God has given them to do, right, as a church. Then you have deacons. Deacons, the word is literally trans, it's literally translated as um, a table servant, right, like a waiter. That's literally what the word means. And so and you have their qualifications that come right after the pastoral qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Again, you can go read those for yourself. And then you have the responsibilities that are given to them in Acts 6.4. In Acts 6.4 is the early church in Jerusalem. There's beginning to be like too much work for the pastors, the apostles to handle at a time. 
So they ordain these deacons to kind of like be the lead servants in the church. So the deacons are the ones that are kind of like in charge of other service areas, right? And kind of take some things off the plate of the pastor and lead in those areas, right? So here's the thing. Right now at our church, and this is part of the reason why we want to grow up a little bit, I am the only pastor, right? We have no deacons, no other pastors um, in the church. This is what this means. Also, we don't have an official membership. So here's something. <laughs> here's something. Uh, this is all just growing pains. This is all just part of it. So here's, here's a problem that we want to rectify in the future. And I'm going to tell you the problem. The problem is I am the only one that's making decisions, right? And you're like, well, why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because I'm not perfect, right? And so I need other people. Don't say yeah. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I need other people. I need other people, right, that are there to kind of help build the wisdom. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that in the, um, the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom, right? And so for long term, again, church being a baby, that's just what it is, right? But for the long term, that's a system that has to change, right? So we want to look to in this new year, one of the things that we want to do is we want to seek out um, other elders, other pastors that we can ordain, and other deacons that we might be able to ordain in the church, right, to help lead the church, okay? So that way, um, again, it's not just a one-man show and, and things like this, all right? So, but in the meantime, so this is what we're going to do to kind of rectify that in the meantime to help us get to there, right? Again, in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom, and so this is what I want to do as a church um, to help us with get to that point where we are ordained deacons and pastors, is I would like for us to put together a temporary leadership team within the church. Okay, and so here's what this would mean. This would mean that these would be people that would come alongside me to help with some of those decisions, especially some since coming up in the new year, we're going to make some of the bigger decisions like a budget and things like this. Um, some of the admin responsibilities, they would meet together once a month to kind of talk through some of these things. And it would be just for the next six to nine months, right? That's it. Just six to nine months, just as this temporary transitionary leadership team to where we can get to fulfilling the biblical roles that God has given to the church, right? Now, this is a serious role, okay, to be in, in this type of leadership role. And so it's one that does have to be taken seriously. And so um, it will require, if, if this is something that you feel like the Lord is laid on your heart, it will require... Um, this. This is like a little application, okay? And, and the reason why, it, there's five categories on this application. And the reason why, it just shows, again, that you are serious. Jesus said this, and I've been meditating on this verse, especially this last week, because it came to my mind. But Jesus said this of himself. He said, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so this is not, again, leadership in, in God's economy, in God's way, is not about, look at me, I'm the best, you should do what I tell you to do. Leadership in the Bible says, I'm going to be the biggest servant to everyone else, right? That's what God tells us to do as leaders. And so um, this is the idea that we have to have some type of thing. So here's the five, the five kind of categories. Um, you do not have to be perfect. So if, if, if you're on, you think, oh, I don't match every single one of them, that's okay. You don't have to be perfect. Um, and every one of them, we can work through that. But um, these are the main ones. One, you have to be saved and scripturally baptized. Okay, That's just part of being part of a church right? and part of what God wants us to do. Next, you have to be connected to the church. So that means that you're faithfully attend Sundays for at least the past three months. Okay, that We want you to be able to have been here for at least a little bit of time where you kind of start to understand the culture of the church. So at least in the last three months, you've been connected to the church and you're also an active part of a small group. Okay, that's very integral to what we do here in that discipleship process. Number three, you have to serve on a crew. So some area of service, and this will just show that you are willing to serve the church already. Serving on a crew in one of our, one of our various serving teams. Um, four, giving financially. That shows, again, our hearts that are, we want the church to continue to grow and move forward. And five, um, inviting others to branches, inviting others to be a part slash sharing the gospel with others. And that shows our heart for fulfilling the mission of what Jesus has given us to do. So again, there's um, if you tick up, there's going to be at the back table, I'll put some out, um, these applications. Um, if for some reason we run out, um, I can email you it as well. 
but um, we could fill that out, and then if you could just bring it back to me next week, um, that way we, I have that. But again, it is a serious role, but it's one that I think is going to be helpful within our church to kind of help us bridge the gap until we can start to put into place the leadership that the Bible tells us that we need to do. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, last one, last one. This one's quick. Grow in serving. Okay, I have a confession to make. This is my, I met, well, I don't know if I messed up as much as I, I've not been the best leader that I, I could have been. We, this, this last year, and it's part, it's, you know, you go through different seasons in life, right? It's different seasons of your life require extra, right? You got to give extra. And so that's really what the first year of a church plant really is. And so um, uh, our teams, our serve teams have really been given extra. And what, and as well as myself, and, and so I've been thinking an idea, the idea that there's still that good rest that the Lord expects us to keep and to hold on to. And so one of the things right now, we have people that are serving at church every single week, right? Um, there's several people um, that come to church every single week, and they never get to come to church with their family because they come here early and they stay late. And so the family goes at different times. Um and that is not healthy again for the long term, okay? So one of the things that we're going to work into um, as our serve teams, as our crews, is that at least one Sunday a month, if you're serving on a crew, you have to take that Sunday off, okay? At least one Sunday a month where you just get to come and actually be served, right, at church. And you don't, you're not going to serve in that way. Again, that is healthy. Uh, it also allows for other people to step up. Um, as the church has grown, um, we've had a lot p more people recently that have signed up to serve on different crews. So, for instance, if you're part of the kids' ministry, this will kind of like not affect you at all because that's already built into the system. We built that from the beginning that basically you only serve once a month there. Um, but our music crew, um, like today, Haley, well, Haley was serving in another capacity um, in the kids' music. But that's one thing. We want to kind of rotate with that because we have more people that are willing to sing now. Um, our setup crew, we have a, a couple extra volunteers that have grown in that, so we want to rotate with those. Um, we only have one person that runs the sound, so if anyone feels like, hey, that's where I want to do it, um, we, need, we need that. Um, but even our, our connect crew as well, our greeters usually are the same greeters almost every week unless they're out of town, and so we want to do that kind of rotation as well as people that make the coffee, coffee each week, stuff like that. And we want to build into that because... It's important to also rest well. You know, we see in, in the Bible there's this, this time when Jesus is healing people constantly all day long through the night. And the very next thing that he does the next day is he takes his, sends his disciples away and Jesus goes to a place of solitude to pray. Right? It's just as important to have good rest in the Lord as it is also to serve. And so that's one thing that we're going to build into um, – our, our thing, this will start probably in November. So it'll give us a month to kind of work through the details and schedules and things like that, um, along with the leadership crew can help work through that as well, that will join in. And that will start in November where we would love for people to serve, but um, you need at least one Sunday off a month where you just come and just worship, right? And you're not serving in that way. Although serving is also part of our worship, and I know that a lot of you realize are like, what? That's a bummer. I want to be here every week. Um, but it's it's important to also have that good rest, and that's something, a quality that we want to be in in our church. You know, it's important. Jesus, I mean, God even set up the Sabbath um, from the beginning of time. He set up a rest day intentionally, and so we want to do that as well. Last thing um, is we want to serve our community. We um, kind of up that a little bit. One of the things that we've done consistently is those street cleanups every other month. But usually that's our only kind of community outlet as of recently. And so we want to grow in that and serve our communities another way. One of the things that is said of the early church in Acts chapter 2 is this amazing phrase. It says that the church grew in favor with God and with man. Right? The idea that the church was producing so much good in their community that not only was God showing them favor, but other the outsiders as well were showing the church favor. Sam uh, said a couple weeks ago during our, our kind of testimony time, he said, man, 
we should think of ourselves as a church that if our church wasn't existent, our community would miss us, right? Like they would be like, man, I wish that church was still here. They're doing some good things. And I was able to go. I was invited by someone that's not part of our church to this event of kind of like community leaders and things um, for the sunset. And um, I got to meet some people, and I was like the only Christian there. But I met this one lady. She runs uh, like Together SF. It's a big kind of organization. And he introduced me. Oh, this is Jake. And she's like, from branches, right? And she's just like, you guys are doing an amazing job. Da 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 da. Like we were noticed by community leaders, and that's something that we want to do more is because that actually it shows people that there's positivity there shows people that jesus is good that jesus loves them and so if you have any ideas to serve the community um every other month we have kind of a gap where we're going to put in another service activity whether it's serving at a school serving at a business serving at something to do that and just like jesus said again in mark 10 45 it says there that he didn't come to be ministered to but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many all right, any questions in that? All right. Okay, all right. Well, the, the, the music team is going to come up. We're going to sing one final song. But I just want to share, as they're coming up, I just want to share this one verse with you guys. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus looks Peter in the face, and this is what he says. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's what I believe for branches. I believe that God is still going to be working through us. I believe he's got a plan. I believe in the things that God has already done through our church. And I believe that God continues to work through us and that he continues to have a plan for us today. And so it's amazing to see what all that God is going to do. I'm excited about um, just how God is going to continue to mature us and grow us as a local body of believers. And I'm excited that the Lord is building his church through us. So let's go ahead and stand. We'll sing this final song and we'll be just...